In this video we're going to take a look at some of the web challenges on the Angstrom 2021 CTF. I'm not too sure how many of these challenges we'll get through, this is the last day of the CTF, so I was hoping to get through some more challenges and, and get into like the crypto and the mist category, but oh well. We'll see how many challenges we can get through here, and any scripts that are created will be uploaded onto GitHub. You can jump between the chapters at the bottom of the video or in the description. And if you like the video, drop it a like and subscribe. Thanks. The first challenge is called Jar, and the description says, My other pickle challenges seem to be giving you all a hard time, so here's a simpler one to get you warmed up. So we're given a link to the web website we need to go and test out. We have a picture of a pickle jar here. And then we have some files to download as well, so we have a Python file the pickle image and a docker file as well. So I've already got these downloaded. Let's go and let's go and have a look at the website first of all though. Let's go and get burp suite running as well. And we might want to enable burp to only capture this traffic as well. So let's just enter in a test here into this add item box and we can now go and have a look at our HTTP history. So if we wanted to, we could say that we want to add this to the scope and then we could also say here that we only want to show in scope items and that will refrain from showing other items. We could also, if we have intercept on, that will capture all requests, but we could go in and say that we only want to intercept client requests if the target is in scope. So I'll do that as well. And this means that if we were to do that again, we can see that we have our hello there. Let's say test as well, add another item and you'll see it's intercepted that request but if we go and have a look at say Google or DuckDuckGo it won't intercept that request so with that request intercepted we can go and have a look at it we can see we've got a cookie here with um, a base64 encoded value so we could grab that and go over to Hackverter and if we want to decode it okay that's gonna base64 encode it okay Let's go to decode, base64, we'll do base64 URL, and paste that in. And we can see that we have some funny looking characters, and then we have our hello string there as well. Okay, so let's go back to our proxy. So it's passing in this, it's making a post request to the add URI, and it's passing in the item which is equal to test. So we could play around with that and put in some different values and see what happens. But we know from the description that this is going to be related to pickles and pickling so um, that's what we're going to want to focus on so each time as well this page loads let's let me turn off the intercept each time the page loads we get our text in a different location and we could go and have a look at the source code let's go to view source and there doesn't appear to be too much for us to look at here so let's go back and let's go and have a look at the local source code and see what's going on. So we can open up jar.py. So the first thing you'll notice is we have the flag variable declared at the top, which is calling os environment.get. And it's either going to grab the flag environment variable, or if that doesn't exist, it'll use this def default value instead. We then have the app root for pickle.jpg, which is simply going to return the pickle image. We have our home directory, which will assign contents the value of our cookies. So if we go back to our cookies, let's hit F12, and we'll see that we have this contents variable with the base64 encoded value. So it's going to grab that. It's going to base64 decode it like we did in Hackverter and found the hello string. And then it's going to load it with pickle.loads then it uh, th this this is what will happen if there's a contents inside the contents variable so if there was a cookie otherwise it'll create a new list and for each item in the items list it's then going to randomly print it somewhere on the screen the final route is the add route so if we make a post request to add which we did do already if we go and have a look at our http history then this was the add post and it takes in a parameter of item so it'll assign contents equal to our cookie value again and if that cookie value already existed it's going to load the it's going to do the same thing as here so it's going to base64 decode the cookie and then it's going to load it using pickle loads otherwise it'll create a new list so exactly the same as we have here and then 
it's going to append the new item, so whatever item we provide here, in this case we've provided the string test, it's going to append that to the list and then it's going to base64 encode it and pickle dumps, so the opposite of pickle loads, and set that to the cookie. So essentially, just to clarify that, each time we add a new item here, it's going to deserialize, it's going to base64 decode and deserialize all of the items that we already added, so the test and hello, and then it's going to add our new item to it, it's going to base64 encode it, and then it's going to serialize it. So what we want to do is have a look and see what is the issue with the pickle serialization. So we'll go and have a look at the Python documentation and see what the potential vulnerability is and how we might be able to exploit it. So let's go and have a look first of all, Python pickle. And we'll just go and have a look at the official documentation. And the first thing we'll see is a big red warning box saying the pickle module is not secure, only on pickle data you trust. It's possible to construct malicious pickle data which will execute arbitrary code during unpickling, never unpickle data that could have come from an untrusted source or could have been tampered with. Now obviously in this case, uh, the, the data which is being unpickled is this cookie variable which we do have control of. We can edit it either here or in burp suite whenever we're sending the request, we can modify it here. So let's go and have a look as well. If we look for pickle exploit, this is a, a really good article describing how to actually exploit the vulnerability. I use this and refer to it throughout the hack the box challenge. I think it was baby internet, interdimensional internet, whichever one had the the pickle in anyway. And this gives us an idea how we can create an exploit for it. So I'll not cover this article in too much detail, but if we scroll back up here, we'll see that there's this reduce method. Um, and by using reduce in a class, which instances we're going to pickle, we can give the pickling process a callable plus some arguments to run. So this means in the example that is given here, they have created a class using this reduce function and it passes in a command to the OS system call so any command that they enter here will be executed and then they're just doing the same thing that's happening in the code here in our in our python code which is base64 encoding the dumped pickle item so in the case of the hack the box challenge we weren't able to simply inject our own pickled cookie we had to modify the value that was already there so let's just go back over what was a little bit what was done in that challenge we can use python -m pickle tools and you can see here that we can pass in a file so let me actually just go and grab the cookie that we have at the moment I'm going to close that down for now go and grab this contents cookie and I'm going to uh, I'll echo this to a file and then we'll base64 decode the file and then if we run python-m pickle tools and pass in that file then it's gonna unpickle so instead of just simply getting let's actually cut out new two so we've base64 decoded the pickled object here and we can see the hello and the test string but the rest of it doesn't make much sense but if we actually use the pickle tools we can actually disassemble that whole structure and see um, see what's going on behind the scenes I don't really understand too much about the structure of the pickles pickled objects but um, in cases where you might need to go and modify some values or inject something into a pickled object then this this would be a useful way to do it as was the case in the hack the box challenge in this case we're just going to try and overwrite the cookie with a, a new pickled object whereby we can use something like we saw on in that article there to create a RCE class which calls the reduce function and makes some kind of system call so let's get this test out locally as well we have a docker file which was given to us so we can run docker dash or docker build dash file docker file 
in this current directory and let it run through the steps to install whatever it needs to. You can see that's setting up our environment variable. And then if we go and have a look at Docker images, Docker image ls, we have this new Docker image. Let's do Docker run. I'm going to pass in dash dash net host and then the image ID that we want to run. And you can see that's launched that as a local server. So let's go and try and open that up. You can see, yep, it's taken us to our pickle. So if we go and try and add a new item here, I'll just say hello, add item, and we can go back to our terminal and actually see that any requests that are made here will be able to view as well, which means we could also go to our source code and make some modifications if we were trying to debug this locally. That could be that could be quite handy. But let's try and get this tested out locally and then we'll test it on the remote server. So I've already got a script created created to do this, exploit.py, so let's take a look at it. It's essentially just what we saw on that on that site. We have our class which is called RCE, but it doesn't doesn't matter. We have our reduce function which will call this callable object and it'll pass in then the parameters. So in this case we're using os.get environment to get this environment variable, the flag, and then we're simply returning that. And then right here with pickling it with base64 encoding it in a URL safe manner and then printing it out. So if I go back here and run python exploit.py it's going to give us a cookie value. So let's go and have a look on our local server first of all. If we replace the cookie and then hit F5 do we get a flag? And it looks like we do. So if we go back to the server and test the same thing out, let's replace the cookie and refresh the page and we also get a flag. Although notice that each time we refresh the page the ordering of this flag is different so it would be quite a difficult task to try and work out what order these characters should actually go in. Luckily we don't need to so if we go to F12 and go to our inspector let's go and have a look at the contents here and we'll see that actually it's in the right order if we have a look at our divs here so we could go through and we could we could grab each of these values or we could do that with some JavaScript. So if we say for divs is equal to document dot get elements by tag name, we want to grab there was no name specified, we just want to grab all divs and now if we Let's set up a flag variable as well. I'll just set this to be to be empty, and then we'll say for for i equals zero, i less than divs dot length, i plus plus. I'm going to loop through, and we're going to say flag is plus equals divs i. So whichever element we're looping through, the inner text. and there we have our flag. So we could also print that out, we could use alert as well and there you can see we have our flag, we can go and submit that. So that's the pickle challenge done, let's have a look at the sea of quills. The second challenge is called sea of quills and the description says come check out a finer selection of quills and then we have a Ruby file as well to download so let's open up the link to the site. We've already got the Ruby file downloaded as well. I'll open that up. Let's just go and test the site out first of all though. So we have a list of different quills available here. We could have a quick look at the source. It's interesting to notice this comment here. Sometimes a car runs away and does not come back ever. I, uh, I thought maybe this had something to do with the challenge. So if we Google this this is the <laughs> this is the site that it brings back. 
Hi there, I'm Kevin, the mastermind Java, HTML and CSS technician behind the scenes of this project. This website was fully developed and created in less than 48 hours. Um, yeah, this is the only reference I could find to this, which I thought was kind of funny. It's not loading properly on, on here, but it loaded it loaded okay outside my VM. But anyway, um, it's not related to the challenge, so let's move on. We This is our homepage, not really too much there for us. Let's go to Explore, and we go to this Quills URI where we can enter in an amount and starting from so amount let's just say one starting from one we search that and it brings back one quill so now if we would say two starting from one it's going to bring back two quills if we say two starting from two I guess it's just bringing back some different quills okay so we could play around with some of these parameters see if we're able to enter something in. Notice that whenever we put in an apostrophe there it says bad, no quills for you. And we could also go and have a look in Burp Suite as well and see what's being sent and received. So whenever this post is going off it's sending our limit, our offset and then columns as well. So if we want to URL decode some of this we can do Control Shift and U just to make it a bit clearer to read. So we have our offset which we've just passed in there as the apostrophe. We've done the same with the amount, I guess, and then columns is passing in the URL at the moment. So actually, let's go back and change this. Let's change this from URLs to something else. Let me first of all just go and put in here. We'll well we'll say I'll just put in a thousand, starting from one. We search that. It allows us to search it. Okay. Let's go and send this to the repeater. And if we send this to the repeater, let me just send that off we get our results here but because this is set to URL and it's it's assigning these URLs here what happens if we go back here and say bring back name and notice now that instead of the image source pointing to a URL it points to what was what we were seeing here as a description previously so presumably if we put in a column here which doesn't exist let's try flag we get back an internal server error so we could go through and try and find out exactly what some of these columns are. Can we just we can just return them all there? But seeing as we have access to the source code, we don't need to blindly test this. Let's go and take a look at the code. And the first thing we see here is that whenever the home page is loaded, it's going to open the quills database. It's going to select all from quills. So let's go back to the home page. And so it's selecting all of the items from Quills and then it's printing them to the screen. If we post to Quills, which was the explore option, then it's sending off, it grabs the columns, it grabs the limit and it grabs the offset and these are the post parameters which it takes them from. And then it has a blacklist here of certain characters and it's going to go through each one of these characters in the columns. So the columns field was where we changed the URL and the name. Let's go back there to Burp Suite. So the columns is right here. So if we go and say put in a apostrophe, you'll see there we get beep boop SQLI detected. So we could look for some ways to bypass this. There might be characters which are allowed um, which have been missed or you can use Unicode sometimes to um, to bypass these filters. So for example, actually, let me go to a URL, a URL encoder and we'll try and decode. If I paste in this value here, decode, this is the Unicode, URL encoded Unicode value for an apostrophe. So if we go back and minimize this, we send that off again. Instead of sending an apostrophe, we send in that URL encoded Unicode value, we get internal server error. So it didn't trip off this this um, blacklist, but we still uh, had some problems there. It still returned an error. So we could look at the other parameters. Notice that the columns was being checked for these blacklisted characters, but the limit and the offset aren't being tested. So this is the actual SQL statement which is being executed. Select and then whatever we pass in as the columns will be entered here so say URL select URL from quills limit and then we could say limit a thousand offset one and 
the limit and the offset, there are also some checks here. Notice that whenever we try to put in an apostrophe to begin with, we got that bad no quills for you. So this looks to be secure, as far as I can tell. It's it's ensuring that it starts with zero to nine and it ends with zero to nine, and that's all that's allowed in between. So anything else we enter is going to re return that bad no quills for you. So I spent quite a while, actually, longer than I should have spent, um, trying to play around with the encoding to try and get some union statements and things working here without properly focusing on what the actual SQL statement is doing. I also tried, I figured if we could um, encode the comments, so if we could encode the dash character, a hyphen character, and then we could say select all from the SQLite master table to try and find out what table names exist and then just comment out the rest of the code. I also tried then commenting out the rest but also inserting these percentage s to deal with these other parameters. None of that seemed to work for me. So the solution that I eventually came to was to insert a union statement without any characters at all. We don't actually need any characters. So in this example we're taking in this select and then the string. Well what we could do is just insert as our string select let's say name from SQLite master but then we have the rest of this code which I was initially trying to comment out but instead we could just say well we'll also then union select name from quills so we're selecting name from SQLite master and we're union we're doing a union query with the name from quills and then the limit and the offset can just go ahead as normal so I'll take this out here I was just putting that in just to demonstrate what we're aiming to do and let's go back to our burp suite and in here we'll just go back to what we had so in columns instead of just saying we want to select name from quills we're going to say we want to select name from SQLite master and then we want to union with select name and it's just then going to take do the rest of the statement select a name from quills so we can URL encode that let's just do control and U there and send that off and we get an internal server error. Let me see if I just take this out. And that seems to have run OK this time. So we can go and have a look. And we'll see that we have some of our descriptions here in stock, in stock as well. The first thing we see is flag table. So there's another table called flag table. If we wanted to, we could also show response in browser. You can just grab a copy of this URL and then open it up. Okay, that didn't give us any better. So we have this flag table because it's showing as the image source, we still can't see it here, but that's fine. So let's close that. So we know that we've got this flag table. So now we want to do what we want to do is see if we can select from the flag table. So let's select name from flag table. And if we try to send that off, we get a server error. Let's try and select all from flag table. Oh, we want to change our offset probably as well. There we go. Okay, so our offset was set at 1, so it was trying to grab whatever was in the flag table after the first element, and the first element was our flag. So we changed that. Now if we change that back to name, that should be fine as well. Oh, no, okay, it still needs to be. We could have a look at what the actual column names are. Maybe it's just flag. Yeah, okay, so it's the flag column of the flag table. And that gets our flag back, so we can go and just take a copy of it and take that to submit. And that's the Sea of Quills challenge solved. So the next challenge is nom nom nom, but considering that Spoofy has the most solves, I'm going to deal with that one next because the competition is ending soon but hopefully we'll get a chance to at least have a look at the next sea of quills challenge after that which will step up the SQL injection so if we open the spoofy challenge it says clam decided to switch from REPL.IT to an actual host and service like Heroku in a typical clam fashion he left a backdoor in unfortunately for him he should have stayed with REPL.IT so we'll go and have a look at this backdoor we also had some source code that we could download there but I already have that downloaded so Let's open that up, app.py. 
So just before we dig into the source code, let's go back to the site. So it loaded up, said, I don't trust you. We could have a look to see if there are any cookies or anything, which doesn't seem like there are. So if we have a look in Burp Suite, we can see the get request that was made. And nothing notable. Here we get a 401 unauthorized, I don't trust you. So we'll send this to the repeater because we might want to play around with it later. But for now, let's go and have a look at the code and see what's going on. So we can see then whenever the main page loads, it's looking for the X forwarded for header in the request headers. And we have a comment here as well saying some people say first IP in the list, some people say last. I don't know who to believe, so just believe both. And then we have a link to a stack overflow question. So we can go and take a look at that. Let's have a look through the rest of the code though. So it's going to create an IPs list based on the parameter that we provide in for the X forwarded for header. Uh, it'll be split in that on comma space and if there aren't any IPs in that list it's going to just say how is it possible not to have any IPs if otherwise it'll check to see if the zeroth element equals the element at minus one and if it doesn't it'll say the first and the last IPs disagree so I'm not going to serve this request and finally if we get past those checks then it'll check to see if the IP is equal to 1.3.3.7 and if it is we'll get our flag here which is defined as an environment variable if not then it'll say I don't trust you so if it's not if it's not equal to 1.3.3.7 it's gonna say I don't trust you that's the message that we were currently getting but whenever we go and try to assign this to 1.3.3.7 we have to be aware that it's comparing to make sure the this zeroth element is equal to the minus one th element. Now obviously lists start at zero in Python so this doesn't really make any sense. So we need to go and see how we can potentially trick this into comparing the right IPs. So let's go and have a look at the article first of all. And it's quite a, it's quite a long article actually, a quite a long question and answer section but essentially somebody is asking whether they can use the X forwarded for header and take the IP but they're saying that it's not safe because uh, if it contains more than one value they could take the first but then somebody could manipulate the value so um, you have some responses here people explaining how it works and how this um, giving some examples here of providing multiple IPs in the X forwarded for header but essentially in in this part of the question which is explaining it quite well it explains that if this gets if a request gets forwarded say to between a couple of proxies and IPs get added on then the final destination for example in this case Google won't know which of those IPs are real and which are, are, are forged um, so some good explanations here there's no point me sitting and reading through reading that out to you on screen we want to get this challenge solved so let's go and play around with it we'll go back to the burp repeater and let's add in the x forwarded for header. So I'll, I'll add it in here x forwarded for. Let's try and put in 1.3.3.7. We send that off and we get the first and the last IPs disagree. So I'm just not going to serve this request. So we can try that again 1.3.3.7. So now we're passing in a list. We know that this is going to split based on the comma space so this is going to give it two IPs so we'll hit send again and we get the disagree so in this kind of case we might want to go and set this up locally and test this out and see exactly you know use some login to see what's going on behind the scenes where's my burp suite gone but uh, I did already solve this challenge so let me just go ahead and without taking up too much time see how we can solve it so in this case it's checking if IP0 is equal to IP-1. So in this case we have IP0. Whenever the split occurs it's going to be IP0 and then it's going to be IP1. So that comparison isn't going to match. But if we go ahead and set up another X forwarded for header. Let's try and set that up and send that. You see we still get the IPs disagree. Not going to serve this request. What if we add this another 1.3.37 so now both of these X forwarded headers both equal the same values so if it receives two of those then 
we get our flag back. Hello, Leet Hack. So here's the flag. Spoofing is quite spiffy. So we can go take that and submit it. And we solve that challenge. The final web challenge we'll be taking a look at is Sea of Quills 2. So the competition is actually over already, but these files are still available to download and actually the servers still seem to be up and running to test remotely as well. Now, I'm assuming the servers will go down, but hopefully the files will stay up because I can see that looking at previous years, if we go and have a look at the 2019 CTF and have a look in the challenges section, although the services are down, we can still go and download binaries. So for example right here we can download the I like it and we can still do the reverse engineering challenges even some of the web challenges sometimes they have docker files or source code available so you might be able to do some of the previous challenges locally as well but for now the services still seem to be up and running so let's go and solve the Sea of Quills 2 challenge so the description here says a little bird told me my original quill store was vulnerable to illegal hacking I fixed my store now though and it should be now impossible to hack so we can go and open up the site. We've also got the source code available to us, and let's go and let's go and take a look at the site first of all. So it looks very similar to the first site that we dealt with. Let's go to the explore section, and everything is looking quite similar. So we can put in here an amount. Let's put in a thousand. Starting from, I'll put in zero. This was the offset on the last example that we went through. And then if we go into Burp Suite and have a look at our po post request, we'll send this to the repeater. And yeah, this is very similar to, so in our last example, uh, let's actually, let's open up the code and try and compare this to the Sea of Quills 1 challenge. So in Sea of Quills 1, we had a blacklist and we had all of these characters blacklisted as well, but we didn't have flag blacklisted. And also we had this regex around the limit and the the offset parameters but we didn't have this columns length uh, greater than 24 so essentially whatever we enter in our columns field here needs to be less than 25 characters long and it can't contain the word flag either so in our last example we were able to inject in here so instead of saying select um, say all star from quills we were able to say select name from SQLite master union select name from quills so let me just give an example of that again actually I'll copy this over from our previous example let me just create a new row here to visualize this so this is our original SQL statement but if we without even needing to inject any quotes or anything like that we could simply ensure that this string in this string uh, placeholder we can enter select name from SQLite master union select name from quills limit offset and that worked fine for us on the last example so let's go and test it out first of all on the remote server and see what's different so if we replace our columns field instead of saying we want to retrieve the URL we're going to say we want to retrieve name from SQLite master union select name we'll do control and U to URL encoder and send that off and we get back bad no quills for you so it hasn't got to the beep boop SQLI detected because we haven't entered any of these characters we haven't entered flag but it's got down here to the bad no quills for you because it's greater than 25 characters so we know from the first challenge that we were grabbing a flag so we were selecting flag from flag table and then we would We'd, that's how we eventually got the flag. We we grabbed the table names from the SQLite master table, and then we found out the the name that we needed to look for. So if we if we send that off, we're now going to get beep boop SQLite detected. But we know that SQLite doesn't um, have case sensitive table names and column names, so we could just go and change these flag strings to capitals and send that off, and that works out fine. But we're still over the character limit. So I spent a little bit of time trying to solve this by injecting comments to the end. So rather than having our union there, if we were able to just uh, insert our comments, 
but obviously the this is this is blocked so we're not gonna be able to send that off so I was trying to do various types of encoding Unicode and hex encoding things to try and get that working and I didn't actually get it working but it's quite annoying because in the first challenge while trying to solve that I had tested out using a null byte and then I never actually tested it out when I got to the second challenge but if we send that off with a null byte at the end you'll see there we get back our flag right here we can open this up if we want to in the browser if we copy that it won't actually show because it's the image source but if we inspect the element here and see the image and it's tried to load the image from and then that's our flag so that was the sea of quills challenge 2 anyway and that'll wrap it up for this video I might go through and solve some of the some more of the challenges maybe have a look at crypto and miss categories and some more of the reverse engineering and binary exploitation challenges so yeah, if people want to see more of these um, video walkthroughs, then let me know what you're interested in seeing in the description. Uh, sorry, in the comments, and uh, I'll try and and take uh, act on some feedback. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed the video. If you have, then drop a like, and any questions, comments, leave them down below. Thanks.